Accustomed as we are to think of China as an emerging nation, we are in some danger of forgetting that her experience of war in all its phases has been such as no modern state can parallel. She had built the Great Wall and was maintaining a huge standing army along her frontier centuries before the first Roman legionary was seen on the Danube. Her ancient military annals stretch back to a point at which they are lost in the mists of time. The most ancient of these is the art of war, attributed to Sun Tzu. But like the arguments as to whether the Odyssey was written by one man and whether Homer ever actually existed, there is some dispute as to the historical existence of General Sun Tzu. What has been established through historical references in the text itself is that the art of war was probably written between 505 and 496 B.C. But the first direct reference to Sun Tzu was made nearly four centuries later. Therefore, an attempt to reconstruct even the outline of Sun Tzu's life must be based almost wholly on conjecture. He would have lived near the end of the Chinese epoch known as the Spring and Autumn period, 770 to 475 B.C. He was born into a military family from the northeastern state of Qi. There he may have entered the army and gained the honorific title Sun after showing great ability during an attack on the neighboring state of Zhu. When civil war broke out in Qi, Sun Tzu fled south and entered the service of Ho Lu, king of Wu. From his own text, we know that he was appointed general and successfully attacked the Chu three times and prepared for battle with Yue. This state of Yue was ultimately able to crush Wu and incorporate its territory into their state, probably after the death of Sun Tzu. There is one detailed story of Sun Tzu the man, and this is how he obtained his position as general, related by the scholar Su Ma Chen. Sun Tzu Wu was a native of the Qi state. His art of war brought him to the notice of Ho Lu, king of Wu. Ho Lu said to him, "I have carefully perused your thirteen chapters. May I submit your theory of managing soldiers to a slight test?" Sun Tzu replied, "You may." Ho Lu asked, "May the test be applied to women?" The answer was again in the affirmative. So arrangements were made to bring one hundred eighty ladies out of the palace. Sun Tzu divided them into two companies and placed one of the king's favorite concubines at the head of each. He then bade them all take spears in their hands and addressed them thus. I presume you know the difference between front and back, right hand and left hand. The girls replied, "Yes." Sun Tzu went on, "When I say eyes front, you must look straight ahead. When I say left turn, you must face towards your left hand. When I say right turn, you must face towards your right hand. When I say about turn, you must face right round towards your back." Again, the girls assented. The words of command having been thus explained, he set up the halberds and battle axes in order to begin the drill. Then, to the sound of drums, he gave the order, "Right turn," but the girls only burst out laughing. Sun Tzu said, "If words of command are not clear and distinct, if orders are not thoroughly understood, then the general is to blame." So he started drilling them again, and this time gave the order. Left turn, whereupon the girls once more burst into fits of laughter. Sun Tzu, if words of command are not clear and distinct, if words are not thoroughly understood, the general is to blame. But if his orders are clear and the soldiers nevertheless disobey, then it is the fault of their officers. So saying, he ordered the leaders of the two companies to be beheaded. Now the king of Wu was watching the scene from the top of a raised pavilion, and when he saw that his favorite concubines were about to be executed, he was greatly alarmed and hurriedly sent down the following message: "We are now quite satisfied as to our general's ability to handle troops. 
If we are bereft of these two concubines, our meat and drink will lose their savor. It is our wish that they shall not be beheaded. Sun Tzu replied, Having once received His Majesty's commission to be the general of his forces, there are certain commands of His Majesty which, acting in that capacity, I am unable to accept. Accordingly, he had the two leaders beheaded, and straightway installed the pair next in order as leaders in their place. When this had been done, the drum was sounded for the drill once more, and the girls went through all the evolutions, turning to the right or to the left, marching ahead or wheeling back, kneeling or standing, with perfect accuracy and precision, not venturing to utter a sound. Then Sun Tzu sent a messenger to the king, saying, Your soldiers, sire, are now properly drilled and disciplined, and ready for your majesty's inspection. They can be put to any use that their sovereign may desire. Bid them go through fire and water, and they will not disobey. But the king replied, Let our general cease drilling and return to camp. As for us, we have no wish to come down and inspect the troops. Thereupon Sun Tzu said, The king is only fond of words, and cannot translate them into deeds. After that Ho Lu saw that Sun Tzu was one who knew how to handle an army, and finally appointed him general. In the west he defeated the Chu state, and forced his way into Ying, the capital. To the north he put fear into the states of Qi and Qin, and spread his fame abroad amongst the feudal princes and Sun Tzu shared in the might of the king. Chapter 1. Laying Plans Sun Tzu said, The art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence it is a subject of study, which must not be neglected. The art of war, then, is governed by five constant factors which must be considered before entering into a conflict. These are the moral law, heaven, earth, the commander, and method and discipline. The moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. Earth comprises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. Method and discipline is to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the graduations of rank among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. These five criteria should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to predict the outcome of a military conflict, let these seven questions be the basis of your consideration. Which of the two sovereigns is imbued with morality? Which of the two generals has most ability? With whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth? On which side is discipline most rigorously enforced? There is a remarkable story of Cao Cao, 155 to 220 A.D., who was such a strict disciplinarian that once, in accordance with his own severe regulations against injury to standing crops, he condemned himself to death for having allowed his horse to shy into a field of corn. However, in lieu of losing his head, he was persuaded to satisfy his sense of justice by cutting off his hair. Tsao was quoted, When you lay down a law, see that it is not disobeyed. If it is disobeyed, the offender must be put to death. Which army is stronger? On which side are officers and men better trained? 
in which army are both reward and punishment delivered most fairly. By means of these seven considerations, I can forecast victory or defeat. The general that follows my counsel and acts upon it will conquer. Let such a one be retained in command. The general that does not heed my counsel or fails to act upon it will suffer defeat. Let such a one be dismissed. While taking the profit of my counsel, avail yourself also of any helpful circumstances presenting themselves not covered in these rules, and modify your plans accordingly. All warfare is based on deception. Thus, when able to attack, we must seem unable when using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Hold out bait to entice the enemy. Feign disorder and crush him. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is in superior strength, evade him. If your opponent is quick to anger, Seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak, that he may grow arrogant. If he is tired, do not allow him to rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. These military devices, leading to victory, must not be divulged beforehand. The general who wins a battle will make many calculations before the battle is fought. The general who loses a battle makes few plans beforehand. Thus, planning leads to victory, and lack thereof will bring defeat. It is by attention to this point that I can foresee who is likely to win or lose. Chapter 2. Waging War in the operations of war, where there are in the field a thousand swift chariots, as many heavy chariots, and a hundred thousand mail-clad soldiers, with provisions enough to carry them hundreds of miles, the expenditure at home and at the front, including entertainment of guests, small items such as glue and paint, and sums spent on chariots and armor, will reach the total of a thousand ounces of silver per day. Such is the cost of raising an army of one hundred thousand men. When you engage in actual fighting, if victory is long in coming, then men's weapons will grow dull and their spirits will be low. If you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. If the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not be equal to the strain. Now, when your weapons are dulled, your spirits low, your strength exhausted and your treasure spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity. Then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must follow. Though we know the stupidity of haste in war, cleverness has never been seen associated with long delays. There is no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. It is only one who is thoroughly acquainted with the evils of war that can thoroughly understand the best way of carrying it out. The skillful general does not raise a second levy, neither are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. Bring your war material with you from home, but take your food and fodder from the enemy, and the army will have enough for its needs. The cost of transporting material to a distant army causes the state and people to be impoverished. On the other hand, the proximity of an army causes prices to go up, and high prices cause the people's substance to be drained away. When wealth of the state has been drained away, the peasants will be heavily taxed. With this loss of substance and exhaustion of strength, the homes of the people will be stripped bare, and three-tenths of their income will be dissipated, while government expenses for broken chariots, worn-out horses, breastplates and helmets, bows and arrows, spears and shields, protective mantles, draft oxen and heavy wagons will amount to four-tenths of its total revenue. 
Hence, a wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cartload of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to twenty of one's own, and likewise a single hundredweight of his fodder is equivalent to twenty from one's own store. This is because nineteen cartloads will be consumed in the process of transporting one cartload to the front. In order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger, that there may be advantage from defeating the enemy. They must have their rewards. Rewards are necessary in order to make the soldiers see the advantage of beating the enemy. Thus, when you capture spoils from enemy, they must be used as rewards, so that all your men may have a keen desire to fight, each on his own account. Therefore, in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those who took the first should be rewarded. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. This is for the purpose of using the conquered foe to augment one's own strength. In war, then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. Thus, it may be known that the leader of armies is the arbiter of the people's fate, the man on whom it depends whether the nation shall be in peace or peril. Chapter three, attack by stratagem. In the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. To shatter and destroy it is not so good. So too, it is better to capture an entire army, a regiment, a detachment, or an entire company, rather than to destroy it. Hence, to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. The highest form of generalship is to frustrate the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the enemy from consolidating his forces. Third best is to attack the enemy's entire army in the field, and the worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided. The preparation of siege engines and other various implements of war will take up three whole months, and the building of ramparts over the walls will take three months more. The general, unable to control his irritation, will launch his men to the assault like swarming ants, and the result that one third of his men are slain, while the town still remains untaken. Such are the perils of a siege. Therefore, the skilful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting. He captures their cities without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. With his forces intact, he will dispute the mastery of the empire, and thus, without losing a man, his triumph will be complete. This is the method of attacking by stratagem. It is the rule in war: if our forces are ten to the enemy's one, to surround him; if five to one, to attack him. If twice as numerous, divide our army in two. Being two to the enemy's one, we may use one part of our army in the regular way, and the other for some special diversion. If one force is twice as numerous as that of the enemy, it should be split up into two divisions: one to meet the enemy in front, and one to fall upon his rear. If he replies to the frontal attack, he may be crushed from behind. If to the rearward attack, he may be crushed in front. If equally matched, offer battle. If slightly inferior in numbers, avoid the enemy. If quite unequal in every way, flee from him. Though an obstinate fight may be made by a small force, in the end it must be captured by the larger force. Now the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the bulwark is defective, the state will be weak. 
there are three ways in which a ruler can bring misfortune upon his army. First, by commanding the army to advance or to retreat, being ignorant of the fact that it cannot obey. This will hobble the army. Second, by attempting to govern an army in the same way as he administers a kingdom, being ignorant of the conditions of that army. This causes unease among the soldiers. Third, by appointing officers of his army without discrimination, and in ignoring the principle that the military must adapt to circumstances at hand. This shakes the confidence of the soldiers. When the army is restless and distrustful, trouble is sure to come from the other feudal princes. This is simply bringing anarchy into the army and flinging victory away. Consequently, we may know that there are five essentials for victory. First, he will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. Second, he will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. Third, he will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all its ranks. Fourth, he will win who has prepared himself and waits to take the enemy unprepared. Fifth, he will win who has the military capacity, and the sovereign does not interfere with his command. It is the sovereign's function to give broad instructions, but to decide on battle, it is the function of the general. Hence the saying, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Chapter 4. Tactics The good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands, but the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. Thus the good fighter is able to secure himself against defeat, but cannot make certain of defeating the enemy. Hence the saying, one may know how to conquer without being able to do it. Security against defeat implies defensive tactics. Ability to defeat the enemy means taking the offensive. Standing on the defensive indicates insufficient strength. Attacking, a superabundance of strength. The general who is skilled in defense hides in the most secret recesses of the earth. He who is skilled in attack flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven like a thunderbolt. Thus, on one hand, we have the ability to protect ourselves. On the other, a victory that is complete. To see victory only when it is obvious to all is not the mark of excellence. Neither is it the height of excellence if you fight and conquer, and the whole empire says, well done. To lift a fine fur is no sign of great strength. To see the sun and moon is no sign of sharp sight. To hear the noise of thunder is no sign of a good ear. What the ancients called a clever fighter is one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease, and thus his victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. To win battles requires making no mistakes. Making no mistakes is what establishes the certainty of victory, for it means conquering an enemy that is already defeated. The skilled fighter puts himself into a position which makes defeat impossible, and does not miss the moment for defeating the enemy. In war, the victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won, whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterwards looks for victory. The consummate leader cultivates the moral law and strictly adheres to method and discipline. Thus, it is in his power to control success. In respect of military method, we have first to characterize the terrain. Second, estimate the dimensions of the battlefield. Third, calculate the strength of the enemy. Fourth, weigh the balance of chances. 
Fifth, plot victory. Characterization relies on the lay of the land. Estimating the dimensions of the field relies on measurement. Calculation of strength relies on an estimation of numbers. Weighing the balance of chances relies on calculation. From this, the result of the battle can be foreseen. A victorious army opposed to a routed one is as a one-pound weight placed in the scale against a single grain. The onrush of a conquering force is like the bursting of pent-up waters into a chasm a thousand fathoms deep. Chapter Five, Energy. The control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men. It is merely a question of dividing up their numbers. Fighting with a large army under your command is no different from fighting with a small one. It is merely a question of instituting signs and signals. To ensure that your whole host may withstand the brunt of the enemy's attack and remain unshaken can be accomplished by maneuvers. Direct and indirect, that the impact of your army may be like a grindstone dashed against an egg. This is affected by the science of weak points and strong. In all fighting, the direct method may be used for joining battle, but indirect methods will be needed in order to secure victory. Indirect tactics, efficiently applied, are inexhaustible as heaven and earth. Unending as the flow of rivers and streams, like the sun and moon, they end, but to begin anew. Like the four seasons, they pass away to return once more. There are not more than five musical notes, yet the combinations of these five give rise to more melodies than can ever be heard. There are not more than five base colors: blue, yellow, red, white. And black, yet in combination they produce more hues than can ever be seen. There are not more than five cardinal tastes: sour, acrid, salt, sweet, and bitter. Yet their combinations yield more flavors than can ever be tasted. In battle, there are not more than two methods of attack: the direct and the indirect. Yet these two, in combination, give rise to an endless series of maneuvers. The direct and the indirect lead on to each other in turn. It is like moving in a circle; you never come to an end. Who can exhaust the possibilities of their combination? The onset of troops is like the rush of a torrent, which will even roll stones along in its course. The quality of decision is like the well-timed swoop of a falcon, which enables it to strike and destroy its victim. Therefore, the good fighter will be terrible in his onset, and prompt in his decision. Energy may be likened to the bending of a crossbow, decision to the releasing of a trigger. Amid the turmoil and tumult of battle, there may appear to be disorder, and yet no real disorder at all. Amid confusion and chaos, your army may be without head or tail, yet it will be proof against defeat. Simulated disorder shows perfect discipline. Simulated fear postulates courage. Simulated weakness postulates strength. Hiding order beneath the cloak of disorder is simply a question of subdivision. Concealing courage under a show of timidity. Presupposes a fund of latent energy. Masking strength with weakness is to be affected by tactical dispositions. Thus, one who is skillful at keeping the enemy on the move maintains deceitful appearances according to which the enemy will act. He must also be prepared to sacrifice something so that the enemy may snatch at it. By holding out baits, he keeps him on the march. Then, with a body of picked men, he lies in wait for him. Sun Pin, a descendant of Sun Tzu, was a general in the Qi army when they marched against Wei, whose general was Pang Chuan, who happened to be a deadly personal enemy. Sun Pin said, "The Qi state has a reputation for cowardice, and therefore our adversary despises us." 
let us turn this circumstance to account. Accordingly, when the army had crossed the border into Wu territory, Sun Pin gave orders to show one hundred thousand fires on the first night, fifty thousand on the next, and the night after only twenty thousand. Pang Chuan pursued them hotly, saying to himself, "I knew these men of Qi were cowards. Their numbers have already fallen away by more than half." In his retreat, Sun Pin came to a narrow gorge, which he calculated that his pursuers would reach after dark. Here he had a tree stripped of its bark and inscribed upon it the words, "Under this tree, Pang Chuan shall die." Then, as night began to fall, he placed a strong body of archers in ambush nearby, with orders to shoot directly when they saw light. Later on, Pang Chuan arrived at the spot and, noticing the tree, struck a light in order to read what was written on it. His body was immediately riddled by a volley of arrows, and his whole army thrown into confusion. The clever combatant looks to the effect of combined energy and does not ask too much of individuals. Hence, his ability to pick out the right men and utilize combined energy. When he utilizes combined energy, his fighting men become like rolling logs or stones, for it is the nature of a log or stone to remain motionless on level ground and to move when on a slope. If four-cornered, to come to a standstill, but if round-shaped, continues to roll down the slope. Thus, the energy developed by good fighting men is as the momentum of a round stone rolled down a mountain thousands of feet in height. This is the use of energy. Chapter Six: Strengths and Weaknesses. Whoever is first in the field and awaits the coming of the enemy will be fresh for the fight. Whoever is second in the field and has to hasten to battle will arrive exhausted. Therefore, the clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy, but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed on him. By holding out advantages to him, he can lure the enemy in to approach of his own accord, or by inflicting damage, he can make it impossible for the enemy to draw near. If the enemy is taking his ease, harass him. If well supplied with food, starve him out. If quietly encamped, force him to move. Appear at points that the enemy must hasten to defend. March swiftly to places where you are not expected. An army may march great distances without distress if it marches through country where the enemy is not. You can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you attack only at places that are undefended. You can ensure the safety of your defense if you only hold positions that cannot be attacked. The skillful general is one who, in attack, the opponent does not know what to defend. And he is skillful in defense when his opponent does not know what to attack. Trust in the divine art of subtlety and secrecy, through which you learn to be invisible, inaudible, and hence you hold the enemy's fate in your hands. You may advance and be absolutely irresistible if you make for the enemy's weak points. You may retire and be safe from pursuit if your movements are more rapid than those of the enemy. If you wish to fight, the enemy can be forced to an engagement, even though he be sheltered behind a high rampart and a deep ditch. All we need do is attack some other place that he will be obliged to relieve. If we do not wish to fight, we can prevent the enemy from engaging us, even though the lines of our encampment be merely traced out on the ground. All we need do is to throw something odd and unexpected in his way. Even though we have constructed neither wall nor ditch, we puzzle him by strange and unusual dispositions. By discovering the enemy's dispositions and remaining invisible ourselves. We can keep our forces concentrated, while the enemy's must be divided. We can form a single united body, while the enemy must split up into fractions. Hence, there will be a whole pitted against separate parts of a whole, which means that we shall be many to the enemy's few. 
and if we are able thus to attack an inferior force with a superior one, our opponents will be in dire straits. The spot where we intend to fight must not be made known, for then the enemy will have to prepare against a possible attack at several different points, and his forces being thus distributed in many directions, the numbers we shall have to face at any given point will be proportionately few. For should the enemy strengthen his van, he will weaken his rear. Should he strengthen his rear, he will weaken his van. Should he strengthen his left, he will weaken his right. Should he strengthen his right, he will weaken his left. If he sends reinforcements everywhere, he will everywhere be weak. Numerical weakness comes from having to prepare against possible attacks. Numerical strength comes from compelling our adversary to make these preparations against us. Knowing the place and the time of the coming battle, we may concentrate from the greatest distances in order to fight. But if neither time nor place be known, then the left wing will be impotent to succor the right, the right equally impotent to succor the left, the van unable to relieve the rear or the rear to support the van. How much more so? if the furthest portions of the army are anything under thirty miles apart, and even the nearest are separated by several miles. Though according to my estimate the soldiers of Yue exceed our own in number, that shall advantage them nothing in the matter of victory. I say then that victory can be achieved. Though the enemy be stronger in numbers, we may prevent him from fighting. Scheme so as to discover his plans and the likelihood of their success. Rouse him, and learn the principle of his activity or inactivity. Force him to reveal himself so as to find out his vulnerable spots. Carefully compare the opposing army with your own, so that you may know where strength is superabundant and where it is deficient. In making tactical dispositions, the highest pitch you can attain is to conceal them, Conceal your dispositions, and you will be safe from the prying of the subtlest spies, from the machinations of the wisest minds. How victory may be produced for them out of the enemy's own tactics, that is what the multitude cannot comprehend. All men can see the tactics whereby I conquer, but what none can see is the strategy out of which victory is evolved. Do not repeat the tactics which have gained you one victory, but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. Military tactics are like unto water, for water in its natural course runs away from high places and hastens downwards. So in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Water shapes its course according to the nature of the ground over which it flows. The soldier works out his victory in relation to the foe whom he is facing. Therefore, just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. He who can modify his tactics in relation to his opponent, and thereby succeed in winning, may be called a heaven-born captain. The Five Elements Water, Fire, Wood, Metal, Earth are not always equally predominant. The four seasons make way for each other in turn. Days are short and long. The moon wanes and waxes. Chapter 7. Maneuver In war the general receives his commands from the sovereign. Having collected an army and concentrated his forces, he must blend and harmonize the different elements thereof before pitching his camp. After that comes tactical maneuvering, which is the most difficult. The difficulty of tactical maneuvering consists in turning the devious into the direct and misfortune into gain. Thus, to take a long and circuitous route, after enticing the enemy out of the way, and though starting after him, to contrive to reach the goal before him, shows knowledge of the artifice of deviation. Maneuvering with an army is advantageous. With an undisciplined multitude, most dangerous. If you set a fully equipped army in march in order to seize an advantage, the chances are that you will be too late. 
On the other hand, detaching a flying column for the purpose requires the sacrifice of its baggage and stores. Thus, if you order your men to roll up their buff coats and make forced marches without halting day or night, covering double the usual distance at a stretch, doing thirty miles in order to rest an advantage, the leaders of all your three divisions will fall into the hands of the enemy. The stronger men will be in front, the jaded ones will fall behind, and on this plan only one tenth of your army will reach its destination. If you march fifteen miles in order to outmaneuver the enemy, you will lose the leader of your first division, and only half your force will reach the goal. If you march ten miles with the same object, two thirds of your army will arrive. We may take it then that an army without its baggage train is lost, without provisions it is lost, without bases of supply it is lost. We cannot enter into alliances until we are acquainted with the designs of our neighbors. We are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country, its mountains and forests, its pitfalls and precipices, its marshes and swamps. We shall be unable to turn natural advantage to account unless we make use of local guides. In war, practice dissimulation and you will succeed. Whether to concentrate or to divide your troops must be determined by circumstances. Let your speed be that of the wind, your compactness that of the forest. In raiding and plundering be like fire, and in defense be as immovable as a mountain. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. When you plunder the countryside, let the spoil be divided amongst your men. When you capture new territory, cut it up into allotments for the benefit of the soldiery. Ponder and deliberate before you make a move. He will conquer who has learned the art of deviation. This is the art of maneuvering. The Book of Army Management says On the field of battle, the spoken word does not carry far enough. Hence, the institution of gongs and drums. Nor can ordinary objects be seen clearly enough. Hence, the institution of banners and flags. Gongs and drums, banners and flags, are means whereby the ears and eyes of the host may be focused on one particular point. The host, thus forming a single united body, it is impossible for either the brave to advance alone or for the cowardly to retreat alone. This is the art of handling large masses of men. Equally guilty are those who advance against orders and those who retreat against orders. There is a story of Wu Chi who was fighting against the Qin state. Before the battle had begun, one of his soldiers, a man of matchless daring, sallied forth by himself, captured two heads from the enemy, and returned to camp. Wu Chi had the man instantly executed, whereupon an officer ventured to remonstrate, saying, This man was a good soldier and ought not to have been beheaded. Wu Chi replied, I fully believe he was a good soldier, but I had him beheaded because he acted without orders. In night fighting, then, make much use of signal fires and drums, and in fighting by day, of flags and banners, as a means of influencing the ears and eyes of your army. An entire enemy army may be robbed of its spirit, and its commander may be robbed of his presence of mind. Now, a soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning. By noon, it will begin to flag, and in the evening, his mind is bent only on returning to camp. A clever general, therefore, avoids an army when its spirit is keen, but attacks it when it is sluggish and inclined to return. This is the art of studying moods. Disciplined and calm, to await the appearance of disorder and tumult amongst the enemy. This is the art of retaining self possession. To be near the goal while the enemy is still far from it. To wait at ease while the enemy is toiling and struggling, to be well fed while the enemy is famished, this is the art of conserving one's strength. 
to refrain from intercepting an enemy whose banners are in perfect order, to refrain from attacking an army drawn up in calm and confident array. This is the art of studying circumstances. It is a military axiom not to advance uphill against the enemy, nor to oppose him when he comes downhill. Do not pursue an enemy who simulates flight. Do not attack soldiers whose temper is keen. Do not swallow bait offered by the enemy. Do not interfere with an army that is returning home. A man whose heart is set on home will fight to the death against any attempt to bar his way. When you surround an army, leave an outlet free and do not press a desperate foe too hard. The object is to make him believe that there is a road to safety, and thus prevent his fighting with the courage of despair. After that, you may crush him. This is the art of warfare. Chapter 8 Tactical Variations In war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign, collects his army, and concentrates his forces. When in difficult country, do not encamp. In country where high roads intersect, join hands with your allies. Do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. In hemmed-in situations, you must resort to stratagem. In desperate position, you must fight. There are some roads that one should not follow, some enemy armies that one should not assault, some towns that must not be besieged. No town should be attacked which, if taken, cannot be held, or if left alone, will not cause any trouble. There are positions that one should not fight for, and some commands from the sovereign that one should not necessarily obey. The general who thoroughly understands the advantages that accompany tactical variations knows how to handle his troops. The general who does not understand these may be well acquainted with the configuration of the country, yet he will not be able to turn his knowledge to practical account. So the student of war who is unversed in the art of varying his plans, even though he is acquainted with seizing advantages, will fail to make the best use of his men. Hence, in the wise leader's plans, considerations of advantage and of disadvantage will be blended together. If our expectation of advantage is to be tempered in this way, we may succeed in accomplishing the essential part of our schemes. If, on the other hand, in the midst of difficulties we are always ready to seize an advantage, we may extricate ourselves from misfortune. If one wishes to extricate himself from a dangerous position, he must consider not only the enemy's ability to injure him, but also his own ability to gain an advantage over the enemy. If in his counsels these two considerations are properly blended, he shall succeed in liberating himself. Reduce the hostile chiefs by inflicting damage on them, make trouble for them, and keep them constantly engaged. Hold out hollow enticements and make them rush to any given point. The art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him. Not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general. Recklessness, which leads to destruction. Cowardice, which leads to capture. A hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults. A delicacy of honor, which is sensitive to shame. Over-concern for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble. These are the five besetting sins of a general, ruinous to the conduct of war. When an army is overthrown and its leader slain, the cause will surely be found among these five dangerous faults. Let them be a subject of meditation. Chapter 9. The Army on Campaign We come now to the question of encamping the army and observing signs of the enemy. Pass quickly over mountains and keep in the neighborhood of valleys, Camp in high places facing the sun. Do not climb heights in order to fight. 
This is the art of mountain warfare. After crossing a river, you should move far away from it. When an invading force crosses a river in its onward march, do not advance to meet it in midstream. It will be best to let half the army get across and then deliver your attack. If you are anxious to fight, you should not go to meet the invader near a river which he has to cross. Moor your craft further upriver from the enemy and facing the sun. Do not move upstream to meet the enemy. This is the art of river warfare. This principle is illustrated by the victory of Han Sin at Wei River. The two armies were drawn up on opposite sides of the river. In the night, Han Sin ordered his men to take some ten thousand sacks filled with sand and construct a dam higher up. Then, leading half his army across the river, he attacked the enemy. But after a time, pretending to have failed in his attempt, he hastily withdrew to the other bank. The opposing general was much elated by this unlooked for success, and exclaiming, I felt sure that Han Sin was really a coward, he pursued him and began crossing the river in his turn. Han Sin sent a party to cut open the sandbags, thus releasing a torrent of water, which swept down and prevented the greater portion of the foe's army from getting across. He then turned upon this force, which had been cut off, and annihilated it, the enemy general himself being amongst the slain. The rest of the army on the further bank scattered and fled in all directions. In crossing salt marshes, your sole concern should be to get over them quickly without any delay. They lack both fresh water and forage and expose the army to attack. If forced to fight in a salt marsh, you should have water and grass near you and get your back to a clump of trees. This is the art of operating in salt marshes. In dry, level country, take up an easily accessible position with rising ground to your right and on your rear, so that the danger may be in front and safety lie behind. This is how to campaign in flat country. These are the four useful branches of military knowledge fighting in mountains, rivers, marshes, and plains that enabled the Yellow Emperor to vanquish four rival sovereigns. All armies prefer high ground to low and sunny places to dark. If you are careful of your men and camp on hard ground, the army will be free from disease of every kind, and this will spell victory. When you come to a hill or a bank, occupy the sunny side with the slope on your right rear. Thus, you will at once act for the benefit of your soldiers and utilize the natural advantages of the ground. When, in consequence of heavy rains up country, a river you wish to ford is swollen and flecked with foam, you must wait until it subsides. Country in which there are precipitous cliffs with torrents running between, Deep natural hollows, confined spaces, tangled thickets, quagmires and crevasses should be left with all possible speed and not approached. While we keep away from such places, we should entice the enemy to approach them. While we face them, we should let the enemy have them on his rear. If in the neighborhood of your camp there should be any hilly country, ponds surrounded by aquatic grass, Hollow basins filled with reeds or woods with thick undergrowth. They must be carefully flushed out and searched, for these are places to be caught in an ambush, or insidious spies are likely to be lurking. When the enemy is close at hand and remains quiet, he is relying on the natural strength of his position. When he keeps aloof and tries to provoke a battle, he is anxious for the other side to advance on his position. If his place of encampment is easy of access, he is enticing you to advance. Movement amongst the trees of a forest shows that the enemy is advancing. The appearance of a number of screens in the midst of thick grass means that the enemy wants to make us suspicious. The rising of birds in their flight is the sign of an ambush. Startled beasts indicate that a sudden attack is coming. When there is dust rising in a high column, it is the sign of chariots advancing. 
When it is low, but spread over a wide area, it signifies the approach of infantry. When the dust branches out in different directions, it shows that parties have been sent to collect firewood. A few clouds of dust moving to and fro signify that the army is encamping. Humble words and increased preparations are signs that the enemy is about to advance. Violent language and driving forward as if to the attack are signs that he will retreat. This point is illustrated by the story of when the army of Yen was besieging the capital city of Qi. The Qi general openly said, "My only fear is that the Yen army may cut off the noses of their Qi prisoners and place them in the front rank to fight against us. That would be the undoing of our city." The other side, being informed of this speech, at once acted on the suggestion. But those within the city were enraged at seeing their fellow countrymen thus mutilated, and fearing only lest they should fall into the enemy's hands, were nerved to defend themselves more obstinately than ever. Once again, the Chi general allowed spies to report his words to the enemy. What I dread most is that the men of Yen may dig up the ancestral tombs outside the town, and by inflicting this indignity on our forefathers, cause us to become faint-hearted. Immediately, the besiegers dug up all the graves and burned the corpses lying in them. And the defenders, witnessing the outrage from the city walls, wept passionately and were all eager to go out and fight. Their fury being increased tenfold. The Chi general knew then that his soldiers were ready for any enterprise. But instead of a sword, he himself took a mattock in his hands and ordered others to be distributed amongst his best warriors, while the ranks were filled up with their wives and concubines. He then served out all the remaining rations and bade his men eat their fill. The actual soldiers were told to keep out of sight, and the walls were manned with the old and weak men and with women. This done, envoys were dispatched to the enemy's camp to arrange terms of surrender. Whereupon the Yen army began shouting for joy. The Qi general also collected twenty thousand ounces of silver from the people and got the wealthy citizens of the besieged city to send it to the Yen general with the prayer that when the town capitulated, he would not allow their homes to be plundered or their women to be maltreated. The Yen general, in high good humor, granted their prayer, but his army now became increasingly slack and careless. Meanwhile, the Chi got together a thousand oxen, decked them with pieces of red silk, painted their bodies dragon-like with colored stripes, and fastened sharp blades on their horns and well-greased reeds on their tails. When night came on, they lighted the ends of the reeds and drove the oxen through a number of holes he had pierced in the walls, backing them up with a force of five thousand picked warriors. The animals, maddened with pain, dashed furiously into the enemy's camp, where they caused the utmost confusion and dismay. For their tails acted as torches, showing up the hideous patterns on their bodies, and the weapons on their horns killed or wounded any with whom they came into contact. In the meantime, the band of five thousand had crept up with gags in their mouths and now threw themselves on the enemy. At the same moment, a frightful din arose in the city itself. All those that remained behind, making as much noise as possible by banging drums and hammering on bronze vessels, until heaven and earth were convulsed by the uproar. Terror-stricken, the Yen army fled in disorder, hotly pursued by the men of Chi, who succeeded in slaying their general. And the Chi succeeded in the recapture of some seventy cities which had belonged to their state. When the light chariots come out first and take up a position on the wings, it is a sign that the enemy is forming for battle. Peace proposals unaccompanied by oaths and hostages indicate a plot. When there is much running about and the soldiers fall into rank, it means that the critical moment has come. When some are seen advancing and some retreating. It is a lure. 
When the soldiers stand leaning on their spears, they are faint from want of food. If those who are sent to draw water begin by drinking themselves, the army is suffering from thirst. If the enemy sees an advantage to be gained and makes no effort to secure it, the soldiers are exhausted. If birds gather on any spot, it is unoccupied. Clamor by night signifies nervousness. If there is disturbance in the camp, the general's authority is weak. If the banners and flags are shifted about, sedition is afoot. If the officers are angry, it means that the men are weary. When an army feeds its horses with grain and kills its cattle for food, and when the men do not hang their cooking pots over the campfires, showing that they will not return to their tents, you may know that they are determined to fight to the death. The sight of men whispering together in small knots or speaking in subdued tones points to disaffection amongst the rank and file. Too frequent rewards signify that the enemy is at the end of his resources. Too many punishments betray a condition of dire distress. To begin by bluster, but afterwards to take fright at the enemy's numbers, shows a supreme lack of intelligence. When envoys are sent with compliments in their mouths, it is a sign that the enemy wishes for a truce. If the enemy's troops march up angrily and remain facing ours for a long time without either joining battle or taking themselves off again, the situation is one that demands great vigilance and circumspection. It may be a ruse to gain time for an unexpected flank attack or the laying of an ambush. If our troops are no more in number than the enemy, that is amply sufficient. It only means that no direct attack can be made. The thing to do is simply to concentrate all our available strength, keep a close watch on the enemy, and obtain reinforcements. He who exercises no forethought but makes light of his opponents is sure to be captured by them. If soldiers are punished before they have grown attached to you, they will not prove submissive, and unless submissive, they will be practically useless. If, after the soldiers have become attached to you and punishments are not enforced, they will still be useless. Therefore, soldiers must be treated in the first instance with humanity, but then kept under control by means of iron discipline. This is a certain road to victory. If in training soldiers commands are habitually enforced, the army will be well disciplined. If not, its discipline will be bad. If a general shows confidence in his men but always insists on his orders being obeyed, the gain will be mutual. This is the end of the CD. The program continues.